want to continue with our discussion about my evolution as a person and my political journey. Uh, I think every everyone's story begins with their upbringing, their their birth and their upbringing with their parents and their family life. And it's very important to understand that my family life had a had a very major role to play in my development in, in a very unintentional, accidental way. My parents, and I was fortunate to have a mom and a dad in the home, and along with five other siblings. It was eight of us. And, it, and my upbringing actually was very typical of a working class black person in um, a industrial city such as Cleveland, Ohio. Now my parents came, were born in Mobile, Alabama in the 20s. And their, their life history was very, very different than mine. Their life history was under a very strict and stern system of Jim Crow in which they themselves were denied access to a lot of things like educational opportunities that I myself later in the 70s were able to take advantage of. As I said earlier, I was the first one, my generation was the first to go to college and college was a, a, a something that my parents were denied access to. And in fact, they not only were denied access to it, they didn't even think that black people even went to college, that that was something only white people did or people with the means of financial means to. And that was something that was on a, on a level of going to the moon for my parents. So my parents did not have the educational, academic, intellectual background that I thought um, that, that many people might take for granted today. So it's a very, very important to understand that the backdrop of my life was that my parents were just working class people. My mom, as I said, was a teacher. My dad was a Baptist minister, although a very conservative Baptist minister. And that's the context in which I grew up under. But I also grew up under a very turbulent time in this society, the 60s. Now, the 60s are a bridge from, uh, I see the 60s, the 1960s, as a bridge from the past to the future. Now, the 60s, the 60s brought us the civil rights movement, the 60s brought us the war movement, the 60s brought us the women's movement, and a lot of other groups aspiring for political rights that they did not have previously. And that's the context, the larger social context that I grew up under. But this larger social context was not conveyed to me as a young person growing up in my parents' home. But as I said, my parents were not in touch academically, intellectually, politically with the movements and the issues that were going on around us. So I grew up not knowing anything about the March on Washington, Malcolm X, Megar Evers, the, the struggles of, that black people were going through in terms of voting rights, in terms of, of uh, the Vietnam War. Those things were totally lost on me. Now I don't blame my parents for that. They were just victims of a racist society. They were victims of the legacy of Jim Crow, of not only the legacy of Jim Crow, but the very brutal uh, experience of Jim Crow in which black people were denied access to develop their human potential. That's the reality I grew up with. But by not knowing a variety of things that it would have been great to have known, that led me to being kind of like a blank sheet of paper when I did get to college. When I got to college in the mid 70s, the mid to late 70s, the lack, I, the fact that I knew so little about what other people kind of assumed I should know and other people did know and I didn't know, that kind of set the stage for me needing, feeling embarrassed in fact, that I did not know a good many things that I should have known. Now one day in my sophomore year, when I was 19 years old, I was late for class one morning. And this class was a math class, and this math, and I was not a mathematician, nor did I love math. But I had made the mistake of taking something that I disliked, math, in the morning. And now I was late one morning, and so in my haste to get to class, once again a class I didn't want to go to, I thought I would take I would take a shortcut through the student center and in my my in the process of taking this shortcut I opened this door and not only that as it turned out that I opened this door literally but I opened the door symbolically to a whole new way of thinking about myself 
about my possibilities, about my life chances, about the political world. Because on the other side of this door was this historic figure. His name was Stokely Carmichael, later to be known as, known as Kwame Toure. So he, even Stokely went through transformations from Stokely Carmichael to changing his name to Kwame Toure. Now, I didn't know Stokely at the time. I didn't know his history. I didn't know even why he was there on campus. As I said, this was all accidental. This was me opening a door, as I said, literally and figuratively, and opening it into a new experience, a whole, a whole new world. So and when I opened this door, there was Stokely speaking. I just dismissed class, the class that I was running to, sat down, and I began to listen to what Stokely Carmichael had to say. And in this experience, this initial experience, this threshold into a whole new world, I became mesmerized, hypnotized by what he had to say. And what he had to say opened up not only my eyes to the possibilities of the future, but it opened my eyes up to the deficiencies of my past. It opened my eyes up to what my parents were not able to teach me, what my immediate surroundings were not able to teach me. Now, back to, just for a moment, back to my, my upbringing. Now, in Cleveland in the 60s, I saw things that no one could, no one even dared put into perspective for me, such as riots. Anyone knows anything about the urban, urban settings in the 60s, riots in the summer were, were uh, almost a rite of passage. And I would see buildings burning, I would see military personnel on the street, we had curfews, we had people were being, sh there were shots and firings, there were firing of guns at night, there were people being arrested. Us young people had to be home at 8 o'clock. Now, no one in my immediate circle, be it family, friends, etc., were able, were willing, or even knew how to put that into perspective for me. But Stokely Carmichael and other people like him were able to put my upbringing, my personal experiences, in Cleveland, Ohio. And as I would say, not only did this take place in Cleveland, it took place in Detroit, Chicago, Newark, all over the country in the 60s, black people were rioting. Why? Why were they rioting? No one explained that to me until I opened that door when I was a sophomore in college and I first heard Stokely Carmichael. Now, as I became to become acquainted further with Stokely Carmichael in the, in the organization he represented, he represented an organization called the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Totally foreign to me what they represented and what they were trying to do. But one of the messages Stokely Carmichael was trying to convey that particular time, that I, the first time I met him, was the, the idea that all black people are from Africa, that you are an African. Never heard such a thing in my life before. And I thought that became kind of the first step on a journey that still persists today. Now, not only did, um, just to go a little bit beyond my experience with Stokely Carmichael, because he was just visiting that day, that day. He wasn't a resident scholar or resident professor or anything of that sort. He was just visiting. He was a visiting lecturer for that day. But there were many people on campus that I became aware of, became acquainted with, that were part of his message, part of his um, um, philosophical view on us being, on, on identity, on us, on our, us being us being black people, and what our our role should be in terms of changing ourselves and changing our community, and reversing some of the problems that have been imposed on us by a larger society that did not have our our interests at heart. 